horrific dives into the past, modernist AI nightmares, and so much more. With Black Mirror Season 6 available to watch now on Streamberry, or we mean Netflix, here's an explanation of all the twisted endings. Joan seems to have it all, everything that is except control over her own life. A nice apartment, a loving boyfriend, and a position of authority at her workplace. But none of it feels like something she chose. When she is forced to fire a dedicated employee and evades responsibility for it, her morale couldn't be any lower. That is, until she sees a show seemingly targeted directly at her on Streamberry titled Joan is Awful. Well, we're watching it. No, we're not watching Joan is Awful, whatever the hell it is. Just did. Curious at first and then horrified, she discovers that Joan is Awful is based directly on her and her actual life. Joan immediately spirals as she sees all of her worst moments slightly exaggerated for dramatic purposes in the capable hands of the person playing Joan, Salma Hayek. With the current anxiety around AI and ChatGPT potentially replacing creatives, Joan is Awful couldn't have dropped at a better time. Joan is forced to learn that she has signed away her likeness to Streamberry simply by signing their massive user agreement when she first subscribed. She teams up with Selma Hayek, who signed over the rights for her own likeness to be used as a digital creation in the show to get back at the people that have tarnished their images. Storming the Streamberry HQ, they discover that a quantum computer has been using AI to render these targeted reality shows. And in the big twist, they find that their reality is in turn a show for the original Joan. Source Joan lives in reality. When Source Joan watches the TV show Joan is Awful, she sees you playing her. That show is the fictive level we're on right now, here. The episode has a happy ending by the time the credits roll, but it doesn't reduce the message. By preying on relevant fears of intrusive technology and the worrying question of whether even our private lives are secret, Joan is Awful takes a meta approach to storytelling that will make most viewers squirm. But there's also hope. Joan ultimately takes control of her own life rather than worry about what others expect of her and we see the quantum computer destroyed and Joan back in the captain's seat of her reality. In and of itself, the world of true crime can feel like a Black Mirror episode. Novice journalists with good intentions, a desire for fame, and an unwarranted level of faith and justice contribute to a massively popular genre that is regularly criticized for re-traumatizing survivors of violent crime. While there's often nuance to the conversation in real life, it isn't nuance that filmmakers Pia and Davis in Lock Henry are looking for when they start digging into local lore around Ian Adair. Ian was a serial killer who lured tourists into his basement to be tortured. He ultimately wounded Davis's father and, according to his mother Janet, caused health problems that led to Davis's father's eventual death. Yet, things are not all as they seem. While Davis is in the hospital recovering from a car crash, Pia pulls out one of Janet's VHS tapes labeled Bergerac, a long-running British crime show from the 1980s focused on particularly unsettling cases. On the tape, instead of an old BBC detective drama, she discovers horrifying footage of Davis's parents torturing a couple to death with Ian Adair. Ken gave me that. We had such fun together. Pia attempts to flee but suffers a fatal injury while Janet, who knows her secret is out, dies by suicide, leaving the rest of her gruesome home movies for her son. Though Davis's documentary wins awards, the lens of true crime has been refocused on him. Alone with the most painful things that have ever happened to him up for public consumption, Davis has gotten what he wanted but paid a terrible price for it. David and Cliff are astronauts in deep space, with technology that allows them to transport their consciousness into robotic forms back on Earth to help them cope with the lengthy time away. When David's Earth robot is destroyed and his family killed by a cult that's convinced mechanical life is an abomination, Cliff and his wife Lana invite David to use Cliff's link for an hour every week to help him cope. Of course, that situation starts getting weird. David develops a crush on Lana, who rejects him, but Cliff's desire to control Lana, their son, and even David's grief process process leads to tragedy when David returns to take Cliff's family away just as he lost his own. Having it all might make a person feel invincible, but in the end, we can't control what life takes. Cliff's arrogant belief that he can control the situation blows up in his face, and with his power gone, he and David become true equals for the first time. Though the episode ends on an open-ended note with David kicking a chair to Cliff and inviting him to metaphorically and literally sit at the same table, it's clear that neither has anything left to live for. Whether they continue on or or don't no longer matters. Whatever they do, they'll have to do it together. 
Set in 2006, Maisie Day takes on classic horror genre tropes by matching the hunger of a werewolf with the unscrupulous behavior of mid aughts paparazzi. Protagonist Bo takes a photo that ruins an actor's life and leads to his death by suicide. While she's told this is not her fault, it forces her to leave the business. That is, until the starlet Maisie Day vanishes off the face of the planet after leaving a film mid-shoot, driving up interest in photos of her. After following her to a rehab clinic, Bo and her fellow photographers are shocked to discover Maisie Day isn't suffering from standard celebrity dramas, rather, she has been transformed into a werewolf. We gotta go. Just a couple more. Though Bo and her peers attempt to flee, the werewolf makes short work of them until Bo is able to get in a single shot that grounds the beast. Bloody, naked, and weeping, Maisie Day begs Bo to kill her, but Bo opts instead to hand her a gun so that she can catch it all on film. With Maisie crying and holding a gun to her head and Bo's finger hovering over the shutter, the parallel between these two very different kinds of shooting couldn't be clearer. While this might seem like a departure for the series, the fact is that there is nothing more Black Mirror than commentary on the toxicity of paparazzi culture. Indeed, this episode only pulls overarching themes together more than ever by revealing that humanity's various dystopias can't be blamed on technology alone. Taking place in England in 1979, Demon 79 centers on Nita, a South Asian woman working in a shoe store. She's regularly forced to deal with racist aggression as her co-worker expresses open resentment toward her and her culture. Nita copes through violent fantasies of destruction and mayhem, but leads a relatively quiet and unassuming life. That is, until she accidentally splashes a rune with her own blood, inadvertently summoning the demon Gop, who tells her that she needs to kill three people to avoid the apocalypse. Let's stop it happening, you and me. All we have to do is deliver three sacrifices in three days. It's only three killings. Noting that there is a surplus of truly reprehensible people surrounding Nita, Gop coaxes her along as she targets who she will kill. A well-meaning policeman stops her just short of her goal, and, well, just as Gop promised, the apocalypse happens. Still, things aren't all bad, as Gop invites Nita along to endure nothingness with him, implying that it might not be so bad if at least they're not alone. While Demon 79 is a farce based on nuclear anxiety, late 70s xenophobia, and unaddressed mental health issues, its heart shows us a bleak level of horror where even basically good acts might not save us from humanity's worst in the end. While Nita has a relatively happy ending, there is no denying that her time on Earth in this episode is majorly defined by other people's racism, without which neither the murders nor the apocalypse would happen. This season of Black Mirror features several Easter eggs and references to past episodes, the most notable of which hinge on its in-universe streaming giant, Streamberry, a stand-in for Netflix itself, from the catchy name down to the flashy logo and user interface. In Joan is Awful, there is a moment of foreshadowing for the following episode when the documentary Lock Henry Truth Will Out appears alongside a number of other self-referential films and shows. These include documentaries like Finding Rip Man, calling back to the lead antagonist of Bandersnatch, and The Callow Years, a nod to Michael Callow from the first episode, The National Anthem. Besides a handful of other Streamberry in-jokes, there are a few references to the white bear symbol that first appears in the season two episode of the same name. First, in Beyond the Sea, the anti-robotics cult members that attack David's family scrawl the symbol in blood on a wall. And in Demon 79, the symbol appears on the rune that Nita finds and accidentally splashes with a drop of her blood. During her vision of the future, politician Michael Smart's Britannia Party logo also bears a a striking similarity to the mysterious glyph. You probably recognize him. He's all set to be our next MP. Well, with a little luck and a following win. <laughs> Speaking of smart, his name appears in a news scroll in Lock Henry that announces his robot police dogs, foreshadowing the bleak future seen in the season 4 episode Metalhead. Meanwhile, the TV series Sea of Tranquility, another recurring Black Mirror reference, makes an appearance in Joan is Awful as one of the shows available for streaming. And in Maisie Day, Bo outs the star of Sea of Tranquility, Justin Camley, by taking photos of him meeting a lover at a hotel. These aren't nearly all the references to prior episodes to be found in Season 6. And for some fans, part of the fun of Black Mirror is trying to catch them all. 
As always, the anthology format of Black Mirror explores the interactions between technology and humanity taken to their extremes. This season achieves this by shaking up the timeline a bit more than it has before, implementing just as many nods to modern life as ever while also delving into the past in three of its five episodes. While Joan is Awful shows a woman forced to see the immediate echo of everything she does on a TV screen, Lock Henry warns of the potential hazards of dredging up the past, followed by three episodes that are trips to the yesteryear of the Black Mirror shared universe. By starting with a tale set so firmly in the present, as many Black Mirror episodes are, then using the last episodes to travel backward, as the show never has before, this season pointedly refuses nostalgia for any perceived good old days before technology came along and ruined everything. Instead, it fleshes out a central theme that technology is essentially benign, and it's the hand in which it rests that determines whether it achieves good or ill. It's important to note that characters that are against technology run amok, such as the cult in Beyond the Sea, are completely detached from reality. This adds an overall sense that learning from our mistakes with tech might be a healthier approach than denying its benefits outright. Much of this season revolves around a slightly more optimistic view that even in the worst possible outcomes, there is always a silver lining somewhere. As of this video, Netflix has not officially greenlit a season 7 of Black Mirror, but considering the ongoing hype around the series, it seems unlikely that the plug will be pulled anytime soon. It confirmed their innermost fears and put them in a state of mesmerized horror which really drives engagement. Series creator Charlie Brooker told To Doom that any season of the series will have to subvert expectations, even if that means subverting his own at times. I've always felt that Black Mirror should feature stories that are entirely distinct from one another and keep surprising people and myself, or else what's the point? It should be a series that can't be easily defined and can keep reinventing itself. With six seasons in the bag, this approach is clearly what's kept fans coming back for more.